Guest today is Steve Husky. In 2003, Steve got out of a taxi near his hotel in Caracas, Venezuela, and was approached by a large man who told him to get in his car or else be killed. Steve was being kidnapped. Needless to stay, say, Steve got in the car, I can't speak today, and what ensued was a hellish evening of riding around the city, his life constantly under threat. Steve did obviously make it out alive, but just three months later, he contracted meningitis and almost died. These two events are defining moments in Steve's life. Steve, welcome to Interviews. Thanks for having me, Abigail. Steve, you were in Caracas for work. In fact, you had been there a bunch of times in two years. It's one of the most dangerous cities in the world. You knew this. How did you typically take care of yourself so as not to get in trouble? Well, typically you try not to stay in Caracas. My father lived on an island just off the coast called Borlamar. And my flight would come in to Caracas, and I would make the connection, and I'd go to Borlamar. Well, this flight happened to be late. I'd been to Caracas you know, nine or ten times in the past, so I was comfortable there, but you always have a target on you in Caracas. So Always? Always. If you're a gringo, you have more money than any ten of them at combined. Uh, so it's important that, that you know your place in Caracas, sure. So what happened this time? I mean, were you caught off guard? Oh, yes, very much so. And, and there were warning signs I should have realized. There are certain cabs you get in in Caracas, certain ones you don't. I got in the right cab. I went well, how to— do you di- How do you differentiate? Black cabs. The cabs that are all jet black will have—they almost look like cabs in London. And they will have a, a state sticker, inspection sticker. Um, almost looks like a, a bill of sale sticker on the side of our cars now. Um, it's big. You can't miss it. And—, and Once you've been there, people will tell you, you know, only get in these cabs. So I got in the cab. The cab driver tried to help me out. Um, If you've ever been down to Mexico, you've seen how they have compounds into the hotels. Well, there was an 18-wheeler that was, quote, unquote, broken down, blocking this compound so I couldn't drive into the hotel. It was a major intersection. So anybody going to this hotel, and it was mainly an American sanctuary hotel, anyone going to the hotel was going to have to walk across this major street, All of a sudden, they can pinpoint you, and they've got you. Well, the the cab driver offered to to stay with me and even turned off his fare light. And I'm looking at the guy thinking, don't worry about it. I got got this. I got to walk 60 yards to my hotel. Um, I'm a pretty fit guy. Played rugby in college, first degree black belt when I was in high school. I'm not really scared about combat. I knew I had a target, but I got to walk 60 yards. And they picked me up and... Once the machete uh, got pointed in my back, it was it was pretty clear that I was getting in the car. So take us through, like, what is going through your head? So this big, imposing guy approaches you, tells you to get in the car. Now, he, he has a machete? So the big guy who walked up didn't need anything. I mean, okay. in South America, people are typically pretty, pretty thin, um, somewhat malnourished, maybe you could even call them. This guy could have been a linebacker, I mean, in the pros. He was huge. Um, So who has the machete? So another guy joined the conversation after he stopped me and got right in front of me. And I'm carrying a whole bunch of bags. It's important to note I've got 250 pounds of bags on my back. I'm bringing a whole bunch of stuff down for my dad. I haven't seen him in months. i got ranch-style beans and cream corn and blue jeans and all kinds of stuff. So my bags are packed. So this guy gets in front of me, and I try and walk around him, and he steps into me, and I try and walk, you know how you do the kind of dance. And So I put my hand on him to walk past him, and he stops me very forcefully and uh, asks me if I speak Spanish. I said no. He said, you know, in a very thick accent, get in the car, I'm going to kill you. So I'm thinking I'm going to drop my bags, and I'm going to heel pick him, which was my move. What is that? What is a heel pick? It's a it's a move where you um, get down on your knees and spin around and grab someone by the heel, but you do it so fast for a big guy. Uh, he's typically not prepared for it. It works very well on big guys, especially a guy like this. Um, so I was going to heel pick him, but you need room to do this. And I look to the side. All of a sudden, there's someone else in the conversation. Now the hair starts to stand up on the back of my neck. I'm wondering if I'm surrounded. The guy who had just walked up, who's to my right side, has a machete. Again, I'm thinking, I've only got 60 yards to go. I can outrun these guys. They just drop my bags and go. And I got really scared. Who's around, who else is around me? Well, another guy comes up to the left. This guy has a gun. I mean, in Caracas, 
they kill and kidnap so many Americans down there. It doesn't even make news. It, it would be equivalent to a fender bender making the news in here in Austin. Nobody cares. It's a fender bender. Well, same thing in Caracas. If an American gets kidnapped, well, he was stupid enough to go down there, and he got what he deserves. So I knew, based on the mentality of, of the people, that I wasn't going to make 30 yards. I was going to be maimed or killed right there on the street. My option was get in the car or, or get killed. So you get in the car. I resisted for about one second, <laughs> and then the machete went into my back. Oh, wow. He didn't break skin, but it was it sure felt like it broke skin. Um, and that was enough of a cue for me to get in the car. So then what happens? I mean, what are they? what do they want with you? First thing they do is we get in the car, and the guy hits me in the head with a pistol. Uh, I am in the back seat, the right side, sitting behind the passenger. And the big guy is driving, the big rig. He's driving. The real short, fat guy has got the gun. He's sitting in the passenger seat. And the other guy, is he's kind of built like I am, um, slim, slender build somewhat, but he's, he's got the machete. I try to open the doors from the inside. I can't open the doors. Um, we take off, and I mean, they are moving. It'd be like it'd be like driving on one of the worst streets in Austin. That's a good street for them, and we're going sixty miles an hour, just banging and driving as fast as they could to get away from there. Um, so the guy with the gun has got the gun pointed about two feet from my head, and they're talking to me. I speak airport Spanish because I worked for an airline for ten years. So I, I worked in an airport, and I speak airport Spanish, and you know I've been to Caracas enough that I speak a little bit of that, but I speak more Italian than Spanish. So I'm speaking broken Italian, broken Spanish, broken English. It's really not a good fit. Luckily, one of the guys knew Italian. He was Italian, so I could kind of sort of talk to him. So what did, I mean, so what did they want from you? Money, straight okay. up. The average Venezolano makes 300 to $350 American a year. I mean, you can pull that out in one ATM transaction here. Uh, imagine being able to pull out 50K from one ATM transaction. That's what they want. They want the money. But they want 350, not 50,000, you're saying. Right. They want 350 bucks. I'm just giving an equivalent. Right. Okay. So, I mean, do you have this kind of money on you? Yes. Uh, I traveled international enough. Keep in mind, working for the airline, you fly for free. So I would go to the airport and fly every week, every month at least. And I would call my banker when I went on an international trip, say, hey, I'm going to Venezuela, uh, you know, increase my limit in case something happened. So he actually increased my withdrawal limit to $800. And, um, you know, they were probably expecting to get 350 which, again, is about a year's wage for them. But um, they, they ended up getting a little bit more than that. So how does that, like, so you, you go to an ATM, you take out a hunk of cash, and th- they're good? Yes, but let's put it into perspective again. Um, it, just to equate things, you can't pull 50K out of an ATM machine here. Just like you can't pull $350 American from an ATM machine there. It's just they don't have that much money in the whole bank. So how much could you take out? Well, uh, 10 or 15 bucks a pop. You're kidding. So we had to go bank to bank to bank to bank to bank and just repetitively go into various different banks. They had first took my target card. All right, valid. It has a magnetic strip. It has a little Visa logo, and I kept telling them, don't take the Target card. And, again, this is in broken Spanish, Italian, not very good, a lot of hand gestures, right? And I keep telling them, this is not the right card. Here's the card. Handing them the card. Take this card. Here's the number. But they wouldn't listen to me. So after we went to about three different banks, uh, they started to get upset. And they weren't able to pull out money with my Target card. So they pull the car into an alley. They back into the alley. And I've been real calm up until this point. They've been saying to me, tranquilo, tranquilo. I've been saying to them, hey, in Spanish again, I'm real cool. How were you cool? Have you ever seen the movie Pulp Fiction? Yes. you ever seen the movie or the the time in the movie where they're driving down the road, real bumpy road. He's got the gun pointed at the kid in the back seat. Boom. Pulls the trigger, blasts the kid's brains out, right? The wolf comes to clean it up. That was the scenario that I was in for hours.